So thank you for your attention and for your time being here. Um, my name is Yancy Valderas. Uh, my husband's Juan Valderas. He's innocent on Texas death row. Um, in my husband's case, he was arrested in 2005. Uh, he awaited eight and a half years at the Harris County Jail for his trial. Um, that is a violation to our Sixth Amendment right to a, fa uh, a speedy trial under our Constitution. And um, from the beginning, from those eight years, eight and a half years, um, we, we saw these injustices um, in, in the system and how uh, this system uh, plays uh, their games. Um, the prime suspect in my husband's case, he um, was arrested. He was charged on two capital murders and an aggravated robbery. And uh, since he was arrested, he started sending letters to the judge saying, hey, um, I, I could testify in, in this case and um, please reduce my time. I have those letters. Um, and finally, um, after eight and a half years um, um, and a little bit of pressure from the Houston Chronicle, and I also had started a petition to push uh, to take the case to trial, um, they finally uh, made an arrangement with this prime suspect. Um, both of his capital murder charges were dropped um, in exchange of testimony and he's now free. And um, that's just to show um, how uh, DAs are willing to work with liars because they have evidence that he is a liar, that he gave, uh, each of the times he met with the prosecutor, he gave inconsistent statements each time. So they know this and they yet they allow him to testify Another thing, during jury selection, in my husband's case, um, in order to be in a death penalty um, case, um, you have to be a, a jury qualified, you have to be for the death penalty. So everyone, uh, all those uh, jurors, uh, they get 14 to, uh, to alternates, uh, they all have to be able to say, yes, I could send someone to death. If you're again, if you're anti-death penalty, you're just not gonna be um, participating in any of those um, juries. And uh, jury jury selection, I don't understand why our attorney or even the DA or even the judge allow the nephew of the prosecutor on my husband's case. Uh, that is not fair. Um, and. Uh, we've always just asked for a fair trial. We, from the, the beginning, like I said, we never got that. And um, we also had the worst attorney uh, that I believe Harris County has, Jerome Gottenich. You could search him up and you could see that he, um, people has been executed because he's filed late. And uh, see, in my husband's case, for all those eight and a half years, we never met an investigator. He, we, he did nothing. And the contrary, he lost four years worth of documents. Everything in my husband's case, gone from year 05 to year 09, gone. Um, how is this? How, how is this not um, an incompetent attorney? Um, all this is, um, is on our appeal and um, also the state withheld evidence, uh, which is called a Brady violation. Um, and we just ask, like I said, we just ask for a fair trial that's been denied from the beginning. Um, and this is the practices that are going on in the Harris County courts. I don't see much change. Um, throughout all those years that we've been in there, um, there's not much change and it shouldn't um, be allowed. Um, I think that if we had the money, if we had 
$100,000, Juan Valderas would not be on death row because uh, with money, you know that you get good representation. This attorney that we had appointed to us by the court had on that year over 300 cases that he was working on. On those months he was going to try for my husband, each of those months he had 90 cases he was working on. And yes, many of those capital murder cases. And that's not right. It doesn't give us uh, a fair chance. And, um, and that's what we're fighting for now. My husband's been there five years and we continue to fight. Um, we were denied our appeal last July. And on August, um, the DA sent us a letter with more information that should have been given at the time of trial. And it's just not fair. This practice is it's not fair. We need to push for change. And here, um, I have out there a petition that I, I, I'm getting signatures for my husband for a new trial. That's all we're asking for, a fair new trial. And hopefully, I know that if he if we get it, I know that my husband will be exonerated. And I here today we have uh, Juan Melendez. He spent 17 years, eight days, and one day on death row. And he was later found to be innocent, so he was exonerated. Here is the prime example why the death penalty should be abolished and how the systems uh, make mistakes. And we shouldn't uh, continue this government program that's called the death penalty. Uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, and I could keep going, but we got a lot to talk about. So uh, thank you so much. Before I started, I want to thank God for keeping me alive all this time. And I want to thank all of you for being here. My name is Juan Roberto Melendez. I'm the number 99 person in the nation to be a senator and liberated from death row for a crime I did not commit. But my story is not that old unique. It's 166 of us. It's been 1,500 plus executions, many of them in the state of Texas. They are real cowboys down in here. And as I tell my story, if you feel like crying, cry. If you feel like laughing, please laugh. I love smiling faces. The only favor I answer all of you is this. Please don't fall asleep on me. <laughs> it was a beautiful day. I never forgot it. It was on a Monday, May the 2nd, 1984. While my co-workers and I was eating lunch on the a apple tree, we hear noise in the orchards that did not belong to the orchards. It was about eight police cars riding the hills. FBI agents, and they stopped in front of us. And they came out of the car pulling weapon at us. And they told us to hit the ground, and we did. Then they called my name. But I'm scared to get up because of the weapon that's pointing at me. But I raised my arm. Then they get, told me to get up and, and, and walk toward them. And I did. When I got in front of them, they wanted me to open my mouth. They wanted to see that I had it. They want to see if I had a missing tooth. And I show it to them. Today, I fixed them. And I'm still working on it. Then they told me to roll the sleeve from my left arm, from my chair from my left arm. They want to see a tattoo. And I show it to them. Then they say, yes, you are the man we are looking for. You are wanted for unlawfully fly to avoid prosecution. We warrants for your arrest for first degree murder and armed robbery in the state of Florida. So they ran me some rights. They slapped some handcuffs on me and they threw me in a police car. Then they took me to a federal prison. A week or so after that, they took me to court in front of a, of a magistrate, a federal judge. And he was talking about extradition, but I did not know what extradition mean. I was naive to the law, naive to the language. This is the type of English I knew at that time. If I say five words in English, believe me, my friend, three of them will be cuss words. <laughs> and that's not English. 
So the Brown interpreted to me to explain to me what extradition means. And all he told me in Spanish was this. You either wave it or fight it. They're going to take you back anyway. So I start thinking, I'm not a killer. My mama did not raise no killers. I will wave it. As soon as they see this ugly face in Florida, they will let me go. How wrong I was. So I wave extradition, and they said, extradite me from the state of Pennsylvania all the way back to the state of Florida. A week or so after my arrival, they took me to court in front of a judge. He was reading the charges to me. You've been indicted, arrested for first degree murder and armed robbery, and the state of Florida is sinking the death penalty against you. They left to share. So a week or so after that, they took me right back to court with the same judge, this time to court upon a lawyer for me, a public defender. The true fact is, I'm not O.J. Simpson. I don't have money to hire lawyers. So this public defender come to me and he packed me in the back and, and I cannot hardly understand what he's saying because they never gave me an interpreter. But he used to pat me in the back and tell me, no worry about it, you going home. I didn't understand that going home stuff. I stood, I supposed to go home. I did not commit the crime. So now we're going to trial. Monday, we start picking the jury. Tuesday, we're still picking jury. After they pick 11 whites, one African-American person, a black man, six women and six men, no Hispanic, and I'm Hispanic. They read the instruction to the jury how to conduct themselves in a capital murder case where they're sinking the death penalty. Wednesday, that's when the evidence come in. And this is what they had against me. They have what they call a police informant. What they call in the streets a snitch. He claimed that I confessed the crime to him. The same police informant, the same snitch, also implicates a friend of mine in the crime. He gets arrested. He's interrogated. He makes 15 statements. He incriminates himself in the crime. He gets charged with it. First degree murder, armed robbery, and they threaten him with the left to share. It's time to make a deal. You see, prosecutors in the United States, they make deals with criminals. So he was able to strike a deal with the state. He gets his first degree murder charge dropped. He gets his armed robbery charge dropped all the way to accessory after the facts. He gets two years probation. With two years, he already got. And basically what he said on trial was this. I picked him up, took him to the scene of the crime, dropped him off, came an hour and a half later, picked him up again, took him home, don't know what happened to after it happened. That's the entire evidence against me. No physical evidence against me. There's the testimony of two questionable witnesses with a criminal record from coast to coast. Two questionable witnesses that made deals with the state, deals with the prosecutor, and they get legacies and rewards for their own crimes they commit. This is what I had on my favor. On the defense side, I have what they call an alibi witness. I have four witnesses corroborating the alibi testimony. I had other witnesses testifying, saying that the police informant, the snitch, had a grunge against me. But I had a problem. Every witness that I had on my side was from the African-American race, a black woman. A black man, and when a black woman and a black man testify for the state, for the prosecutor, all of a sudden they got good credibility. They even dress them. I never saw my co-defender with a three-piece suit on. I never saw my co-defender with a clean shave. In the streets, they used to call him the wolf. But when a black woman and a black man testify on my side, all of a sudden that credibility is gone. Thursday, they found me guilty. Friday, the very next day, 10 o'clock in the morning, I was already sentenced to death. And the judge complained that it was taking too long. When they sent me to death, my heart got full of hate. Hated the prosecutor, hated the judge, and hated that one that packed me in the back, my child defense lawyer, because I felt he betrayed me. But overall, I was scared, very scared to die for a crime 
at the enactment. So now I'm going to death row. That was an ugly day. I never forgot it. It was on a Tuesday, November the 2nd, 1984. The place was horrified. It was dark. It was cold. And they, and they keep me in a six by nine foot cell. And every time they move me out of that cell for whatever reasons, I got shackles in my leg, chains in my waist, and handcuffs in my wrist. The place was also infected with rats and roaches. So now they throw me down in the bottom floor. 17 condemned dead row prisoners in the bottom floor. 17 in the second one, seven in the third. And I made the 248 men condemned to death in the state of Florida. Send the restated the death penalty in 1976. The food. They put the food in the car, and they wheel that car, and they throw in the wind where you at. And breakfast, oh, that's the worst one. But not because of the food. I love bits and eggs. It's because they come real early and they never wake you up. And they place that breakfast tray in the flat, in the, in the, in the flat that you have in your cell door, like a big mail slot. And if you wait five seconds and you bunk to get up and get that tray, forget about it. You ain't run out of luck. You see, the roaches and beat you to it. They waiting for the breakfast too. And it get cold in northern Florida. And they supply us with a thin blanket. And I take that blanket and I cover myself from foot, face, and all. I don't want to see nothing. But the rats, they also get cold. And they want to climb, and they climb that blanket because they want to get warm. And I can feel that rat just running up and down. I don't want to look at them. <laughs> because if I look at them, I'm not going to be able to sleep. But when that rat stays still in my chest and he's not moving, I get a good grip of the blanket, and I shake it hard as I can. I can hear that rat hit the floor. It is a big one. <laughs> so I arrive over there on a, on, a, on, a, on a Tuesday, not that Thursday. The following Thursday, they has created a 10 person in the state of Florida. When I leave that place, 51. Today, 99, I'm still counting. But when they has created that 10 person, I got super scared. You see, I do not know the language that well. I do not know the process. So the thoughts in my mind is this. They're killing people here every week. How long is going to be before they get me? So I had to come up with a plan. I took the cheese from my bunk and I cut it all in pieces. And I make little ropes with it. And I take these little ropes and I tie the cell door bars. See, the cell door bars slide like this. I tie this in. When they push the ball on that control room, that, that door is moving nowhere. So I'm thinking, by the time they come over here and cut all these drops, I know, I know how, how to box a little bit, and I know all these exercises, how you keep the muscle flexible, and you can defend yourself. If they come over here, I'm just going to fire them. And I walk into that chair. When I think about it, I'm scared of electricity anyway. So I got the door so tied up. And I'm doing exercise. And it's around count time. I'm sweating real good. I'm trying to make muscle come out of my eyebrows. You see, I'm trying to intimidate these people. I'm trying to scare them. But all the time, I'm the one scared. I'm the one intimidated. So the door's all tied up. And here comes this correction office doing his round of count. He's a tall African-American person, a big black man. He had muscle in his eyebrows. So when he get in front of, he's, when he's in front of my door, in front of my cell, he see the door so tied up, he gets angry. And he start cursing. Melendez, boy, you got the damn door so tied up. I do not know too much English, but I know how to curse. <laughs> so in a very, very, very way, I remind him of his mother, Father, all the way down. So now this correction officer and I, we're discussing each other south. And the rest of the condemned men to death, they got involved in the argument. But to my surprise, was against me. They tell me that I'm wrong. So now I get angry with them. And I tell them the best way I can. They're killing people here every week. And we ain't doing nothing. We're supposed to fight these people. 
We're supposed to burn the place down. We Puerto Ricans don't go out like that doing nothing. We fight. They still told me that I was a fool. They told me that I was crazy. They told me that I did not know that all I, all I do is get up in the morning and get in the cell door bars and nag and curse and cry about my innocence. Then they told me that I did not know how to read. I did not know how to write. And I did not know how to speak English. And then they told me the most beautiful thing I could hear that time. They told me they would teach me. The worst of the worst. The most indesirable and hated people in this nation. They wanted some prosecutor come monsters. Told this Puerto Rican how to read, how to write and how to speak English. If they would never taught me, I would never survive that place. I would not be able to communicate better with my lawyers. I would not be able to reply the letters that so many pen pals wrote me. Some of them from this great state of Texas that showed me so much love, so much compassion that made me feel like a human being. And today, I would not be able to share with all of you this sad story. I spent 17 years, eight months, and one day in Florida death row for a crime I did not commit. After 10 years, I was tired of it. I went out of there. But the only way out is to commit suicide. And believe me, last of my friends committed suicide. And I'm going to tell you how they do it. They got what they call a runner. A runner is an inmate that's doing time in prison population. He's not sentenced to death. And they give this runner out of prison population so he can do the job in the death row place. You see, the correction officers, they don't do nothing. All they do is watch you. And some of them will give you a hard time when they can. This runner, this inmate that's not sentenced to death, He's the one that supplies us with the food, the toothpaste, the toothbrush, the map and the broom so you can clean yourself. He also can supply you with a tool that you can take your life with. And he knows it. All you got to do is give him four post stamps or a pack of cigarettes rolling paper tobacco, the cheap kind. And he will give you this tool. Perhaps he do it because his items that I didn't mention are more important to him than your life. Or perhaps he do it because he called himself assisting you, helping you. He was there. He know you want out of there. He know that the row is hell. The tube is real simple. It's a garbage plastic bag, the strong kind. You give him four post times, and, and when the guard is looking, he will swing that bag inside your cell. You take that bag, you twist it up, and you make a rope. Then you put a noose in it. You put the noose on your neck, and you tie the other ends in the cell door bars. You throw yourself down, you're dead, but you're free. That's what the demons used to tell me. Why? Why you got to go through all of this? You're supposed to be a Puerto Rican man, a real macho man. Don't satisfy them. Satisfy yourself. You say you didn't do it. You think they're going to believe you? They're going to kill you anyway. So grab that bag. I never saw my friends killing themselves. Because I cannot see to the walls. But I always see, look, when they wheel the body out, something in the back of my head tells me, you're not going to look at your friend for the last time. So I have a mirror in myself. I take it and I stretch my arms to the bus with it and I look and this is what I see. I see a purple blue face that do, that do not look like my friend. I get to see something else too. I get to see the noose in his neck because they never take it out and, and that stay in my mind. So now I want to take this trip. You see, I'm tired of it. I want out of there. I'm depressed. So I tell the runner, give me, give me, give me that garbage bag. So I give him four stamps and when the guy was looking, he swing that bag inside myself. I twisted a rope and I made a rope. Then I put a noose in it. Then I look at my bunk and I look at the rope and I say to myself, I better lay down and think about this a little bit more. <laughs> so 
So I took that rope that I just made to take my life with, and I throw it on the, the bunk. So when the guys walk by, they don't see it. And I lay down. When I lay down, I fell in a deep, deep sleep. And I start dreaming. I'm a little kid again, doing the things I used to do when I was a little kid. The things that made me happy, the things that made me smile. You see, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, but I was raised in the island of Puerto Rico. They took me back when I was just a little kid. And when I look at the east side, it's a wonderful mountain. And if I walk six minutes toward the south, I find myself in the most beautiful beach in the world. It is to me. So here I am, dreaming that I'm swimming in the beautiful Caribbean Sea. The water is warm. The sun is so bright. The sky is so blue. The palm trees look so good. It's a beautiful day. Then I get to see something that I never saw before. Four dolphins coming my way. And they pass me. And a pair got in one side. And a pair got in another side. And they start flipping and jumping like dolphins do. I'm having a ball in there. I'm so happy. Then I look to the shore. And it's a beautiful woman waving at me, smiling at me, throwing kisses at me. And she seems so happy. And I know why she's happy. She's happy because I'm happy. That's my dear mother. Then I wake up. When I wake up, the bones smell like a beach. So I take that rope that I made to take my life with. And I walk straight to the toilet with it. And I look at the rope. And I look at the toilet. And I say real loud, I don't want to die. And I flush it. But the truth fact is, it was lots and lots and lots of beautiful dreams. Every time I got depressed, every time I went out of there, every time suicide thoughts came to my mind, our Creator God sent me a beautiful dream. And I was wise enough to grab all them dreams as a sign of hope that one day I would be out of there. I would be free, like God was telling me, hey, I know you didn't do it, but I control the time. You get out. When I say you get out, you just got to trust me. It took 17 years, eight months in one day. I, I came to this conclusion, analysis. It. it took 17 years, eight months, and one day to also change the man. The death penalty. The death penalty is a law made by human beings and carried out by human beings. And we all know we humans, we make mistakes. The death penalty is also a law that brings a lot of suffering, a lot of pain on both sides of the family, on the family victims of homicide, and the family of the man and woman that's condemned to death. What family is concerned, this is all I had. Mama and five ants. I do not know how the ants are in this generation. But in my generation, when I was growing up, if my aunt caught me doing something wrong, believe me, my friends, it's going to be a good ass whipping. <laughs> and then I got to get on my knees and pray to God that she don't tell mama. Because when she tell mama, it's going to be another good ass whipping. <laughs> but when I was hungry, my aunts always fed me. When I needed clothes, my aunts always my aunts always bought it for me. And in that row, they never forgot me. They wrote me lots and lots of letters. They sent me a lot of pictures, photos of the one that born and, and I never seen. And, and I saw all of them grow up to pictures. They love to keep the family together. And mama, I have to tell you, I believe she suffered more than anybody. She also wrote me lots and lots of letters that gave me so much hope and helped me keep the will to live. But it's one letter that I keep with me all the time. And when I'm down and out, sad and weak, I read it. And it always boosts me up. And it go like this. She wrote and says, son, I just built an altar. And that altar, 
I put the statue of the Virgin of the Guadalupe in it. And I call roses and I put it in it. And I pray three rosaries a day, thinking, searching, looking for a miracle. And that miracle will come soon because I know you're innocent. And God knows that you're innocent. But you got to put all your trust in God. And one day, he will send you free. 17 years, eight months in one day, the miracle came true. Thank you, God, but it took too long, God. <laughs> and this I found out a week or so after, my, after I've been out. I went to my mama's room and, and I noticed that tears was running down her cheeks. And I said, Mama, Mommy, what's wrong? And she said, Son, in spite that all that faith and hope that I have in God and, and God and, and the vision of the Guadalupe, for all them years, for all them long, long years, I was saving money to bring the dead body back to the island of Puerto Rico and bury you if the state of Florida would have executed you. And no mother in this world should go to that pain. I would like to tell you more about the medical conditions and some of the type of people that work in these places. And, the, and, the, and more of the suffering pain of both, of both families, the beaten family for murder and the family of a condemned man. But I don't have that much time. But I will tell you this. I will tell you the worst for me in there. The worst for me in there is this. It's when they execute someone. You see, I'm in this cell. Next to me is another person condemned to death that I know for 10 or 15 years, perhaps more. He cries in my shoulders. I cry in his. He shared with me his most intimate thoughts. I share mine with him. I slowly learn to grow to love him. And one day they snatch him out of that cell. And I know what's going to happen. They're going to kill him. And I cannot stop it. My time is the electric chair. And they got to generate the chair with electricity. Because it's 2010 volts that got to go to his body in order to get him killed. And I can hear this bossy sound. Mm, mm, mm. That's still in my mind. And I know precisely the time when they burn the life out of him. Because the lights flip on and off, and I cannot stop it. But the saddest part of all is this. Some of them are innocent, like Jesse Tefaro, Benny Dens, Leo Jones, Pedro Medina, and my homeboy from Puerto Rico, that in a, on a legal plea bargain, the state of Florida offered him five years. He did not took it, simply because he did not commit the crime, and it cost him his life. Angel Nieves Diaz. And all I can say is this, I'll see you soon. But enough of sad stories. Let me tell you how I got out of there. And I will tell you right from the jump, I was not saved by the system. I was saved in spite of the system. Some people call it luck, I call it a miracle. So here comes my attorney with tears running down her cheeks. And she tells me, Juan, I cannot handle your case no more. I say, why, Miss Gale? You know my case better than anybody. I don't need no new lawyers now. And she say, you know why? I lost five clients. They are your friends. No mistake when she say she lost five clients. It's five human beings that the state of Florida executed. If you're going to become a criminal lawyer, and I wish you will, we need you, be careful with the death penalty cases, they can get to you. So, so she told me, don't worry about it, Juan. I'm gonna get, get the agency to assign for you the three best lawyers they have and the best investigator. I finally got the dream team. So here come my new lawyer, and he tells me, Melendez, you ain't lost too many appeals. I told him, tell me something new. Then he, he say, but we're going to try one more time. But if you lose this one, you'll be lucky if you live three years. I say, if I lose this one, I'll be lucky if I live a year and a half. You know who the governor of Florida is. 
He will have no problem in signing my death warrant. So the strategy was to send the investigator out to go and talk to my trial defense lawyer. Remember the one who used to pat me in the back and the first miracle of cure. My trial defense lawyer, he just became a judge. And I thank God for that. You see, by him becoming a judge, it creates in the legal world what they call a conflict of instruments. And that conflict of instruments gave me the opportunity to move my case out of the racist county. Out of the county where they fabricated the case against me. Out of the county where the good old boy network operates. So we moved from Balto, Paul County, Florida, and by the way, don't go over there. It moves to Hillsborough County, Tampa, Florida. And it falls in the hands of a brave, brave woman. A woman that wants to do the right thing. I can sincerely say, I owe that beautiful woman my life. Her name is Honorable George Barbara Fletcher. So going back to the story when my investigator going to see my trial defense lawyer, the one that used to come, this became a judge who used to pat me in the back. He tells her, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a judge now. I'm in a new office. But in the old office where I used to do my defense work, I believe it's a box in there with the name Melendez running on it. You can go over there and have it. So she rushed over there and grabbed that box and took it to her office and went inside and dug out a tape cassette. And she played it. Guess what? The confession of the real killer was in that tape that said. And my child defense lawyer had it one month before trial. He's opened the case of wounds now. The case is in the hands of, of a courageous woman that wants to do the right thing. So after George Honorable Barbara Fletcher listened to the tape confession of the real killer, she immediately made a court order to the prosecution office, to the one that prosecuted me, and demanded that he send any documents, any notes, any information on my case to do so, and he did. Guess what? He had a transcript, a copy of the, of, the, of the tape confession of the real killer. He also had it one month before trial. But he had something else too. He had 16 documents that corroborated the tape confession of the real killer. Seeking documents that he never turned in to trial defense lawyer at the time of the trial were created in the legal world. A Brady rule violation will hold in escapatory evidence, evidence they indicate that you did not commit the crime. By that time, I already had about three eventuality hearings, and I was able to establish more than 20 witnesses that also corroborated the take confession of the real killer, including the wife and sister of the real killer including law enforcement officers, former prosecutor investigator, former FBI agent, criminal lawyers, friends of the real killer. In the end, they found physical evidence against the real killer. The real killer was also a police informer. So now, Honorable Barbara Fletcher got all this ammunition and decided to write a 72-page page opinion on it. And that 72-page opinion, she chastised the prosecutor for the way he handled the case. She chastised law investigator for the way they investigated the case, and she chastised the man that pat me in the back for the way he called himself a, a defending me. And she granted me a new trial. In the, in the opinion, she implied that you have a man, an innocent man, in death row. The prosecutor decided not to process the case, dismiss the case, drop the case, and that's why I'm here, thank God, talking to all you now. I never know the time and date they was going to release me. It caught me totally by surprise. They put shackles in my legs, chains in my waist, and handcuffs in my wrist. And they took me to a place they call the information room. They sent me in a chair. In front of me is a desk. Behind the desk is a lady working on computers. And she started making some silly, naive, stupid questions. She asked me for my social security number. I give it to her. I know it by heart. Then she came up with some more naive, stupid, stupid question. Where are you working at? <laughs> what type of job you have? I must give her a real look. Because she got up at the chair she was sitting on and put both hands in the desk that was in front of me. And she almost came close, put her face close to mine, almost whistling in my, in my ear, she said. Melendez, you don't have, you don't understand what's going on here, do you? I say, lady, 
I don't have the slightest idea. I live across the streets. I've been in there for almost 18 years. I'm in that row. They don't have no jobs in that row. <laughs> then she said, she, she got a little more closer to me, and she said, we have, we have, we have, fini we have getting your paperwork together. They're going to release you today. And I don't know if, if you watch cartoons, and you see this cartoon character. He takes a slow hammer. He's the other one inside the head with it. Boom! And you can see that now they go straight up. <laughs> then he has a ring of stars in his head. He's in a state of shock, but he's smiling. That's how I was. <laughs> in a state of shock, but smiling. And I'm, I'm still smiling today. Then the correction officer says, they start acting different. They offer me sandwiches and soda pots. I don't want no sandwich. I don't want no soda pot. I want to go back to my cell, pack everything up, and get the hell out of here. <laughs> then I had to take physicals. And I never seen these people work so fast, pushing everybody out of the way so, so they can attend me. Then they start calling me something that I never hear before. They start calling me Mr. Melendez. And I kind of like that a little bit. <laughs> so now I'm in the cell, packing everything up, and my personal stuff and the rest I give it to them and I want to say goodbye to my friend in the last cell and I'm in the cell next to last. I got tears running down my cheeks. I got, I got a big smile in my face. But when I got in front of him, I could not say nothing. All of a sudden I got sad because I leave them behind. The ones that taught me how to read, how to write, how to speak English, in such a extent, how to let hate and anger go. And I know the destiny. If we do not abolish the death penalty, some of them will be executed. This friend of mine that, but he was able to talk. He had tears running down his cheeks and a big smile on his face. And the first word that came out of his mouth was this like this. He told me, don't get in no trouble there. Then he say, take care of yourself. Then he say, don't forget about us. And the last word was, Take care of your mama. They all know my mama. This friend of mine that shared these kind words with me before I left, his name is Clarence Hill. He changed it to Racha because he became a Muslim. Unfortunately, I have to tell you that on a Wednesday, September 7, 2010, he was executed. May God rest his soul. So there's about every one of them was telling me the same thing. And before I get to that door to, the, to leave that wind, that floor, I hear a clap. Then I hear a second clap and a third clap. They was making so much noise, clapping their hands, banging the cell door bars, and whistling that the correction officer got angry with them, told them to shut up, to be quiet. Then stopped making noise to I left that place. They was real happy to see me go. So now when the door that gonna lead me to freedom, and when they opened that door, this is what I saw. I saw a whole bunch of reporters, CBS, NBC, the whole letters of the alphabet was in there. <laughs> and no offense and no disrespect, but reporters sometimes they make some silly, naive, stupid questions. The first one was, how do you feel? <laughs> I did the Jane Brown on him. I feel good. <laughs> then come this, report, this female reporter with some more crazy questions. Where you going? What you wanna do? What you wanna see? I ain't told her I wanna go to Disney World. <laughs> I told her and it came naturally, it came from my heart. And they wrote it down this like I told her. I told her I wanna see the moon. I wanna see the stars. I wanna walk on grass on dirt. I wanna hold a little baby in my arm and, and play with him. Of course I told her. I wanna talk to some beautiful women. That reporter I had in front of me, she was ugly. <laughs> well, that's a joke and my luck. I miss the things that we take for granted, the simple things in life. I cannot understand the people in the free world when they tell me they're bored. When God has created so many things for us that we can enjoy, take care, and love. So many good deeds, so many good choices we can make in life. And speaking about good deeds and, and good choices, I have a confession to make. I'm still a dreamer. I dream and I pray to God every day that in my time, I can see the death penalty abolished. 
but this dream cannot come true if all of you don't get involved in it. You are part of my dream now. You see, the problem with the death penalty is all about education, details. People need to know. That is racist. People need to know. It do not deter crime. People need to know. That is cruel and unnecessary. We got alternatives. People need to know. That it costs too much. But the most important thing that people need to know is this. Along this great state of Texas habit that I love so much, any nation, any country, it always will be a risk to execute an innocent one. And we can always release an innocent man from prison. We don't have no problems with that. But we can never, and I repeat, we can never release an innocent man from the grave. And that's why we got rid of segregation. And that's why we got rid of slavery. White, black, brown together in harmony. We can get rid of the, this epidemic of the death penalty. I love you all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's a good question. I was released uh, Jan January the, on a, on a, on a Thursday, Thursday, January, January the 3rd, 2002. And I celebrate that day. I'm the luckiest man in the world. I got two birthdays. The one I, when I born in 1951 and the one when I got, got, got released. I feel like I'm born again. That's a good question. Repeat it again, say it real loud. How people get involved in uh, I have a man that can answer that question. Thank God. They go me today. That's the question I like to hear. Okay. I'm with an organization called the Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. And if you sign the MC's petition out there, I'll get your name and telephone number or whatever's on there, email, and we can get you involved. We need, the, the only way the death penalty is going to be abolished is for younger people to get involved in it. They're the one who want to do it. We need the young people. Uh, older people, like I've been working against it for 25 years, and I'm only 20 years old. <laughs> <laughs> we need young people to get involved. And so if you sign a petition out there for Yancey, we can get your contact information, and then you can do educational programs, uh, you can uh, participate in protests. You can go up to the state legislature and tell them you want to get rid of the death penalty. You can write letters to the editor. Uh, you can call the legislator, call the governor, you can do all that. You can talk with your friends. You can have other educational programs. Uh, it's, a lot of this is just pure education. Pure education, because people, until they hear somebody like Juan, they don't, you don't know about it. You don't know how bad it could be, and you can't. You don't know that mistakes are made. You know, we've had, he, he mentioned in the beginning of this talk that we've had 166 people across this country that were sent to death row were later exonerated. How many innocent people have actually been executed? I can count, I think I can count up to about 10 or 12 people just in Texas, one state. So we've executed innocent people. We've sent many people to death row that later got off, fortunately, but you know, 18 years of his life, what does that do to your life, right? So, uh, education is the big thing, and you can help us educate. They, they don't sit down yet, you're doing good. Uh, tell them about the, tell them about, uh, about what they can do with Reese, with Randy, Randy Reese. Oh, yeah. So there's a, there's an execution coming up right now. That's on the 20th. Uh, there's a petition. Uh, it's uh, freerodneyreed.com. Uh, Two days. Yes.
um, and protest that execution. I'm sure um, thousands will be there. Please join us. Uh, but no, we have faith that it will be stopped before then. So go to freerodneyreed.com. Also on Facebook is uh, Read and Read Justice Initiative. Right. You can go along, like your page, and follow everything that, that everyone across the country is doing for Rodney. So that, that, uh, Good. Just, just so you know, we've had, I think, 600, over 650 executions in Texas since 1982. 500. We're the number, we're the number one state in the nation by a five to one ratio, our state of Texas. And, uh, and this is a political thing. There's politics involved. Politicians think if they support the death penalty in the state of Texas, it will be good for the next election. This so one is not like that. <laughs> and also there's the, uh, the law of parties. It's a law that, you know, you don't have to be the shooter. But if you were around them, uh, or if you were in the car and they're inside the building, you're with them, you also get the death penalty. So there's been a lot of people who have been executed and never killed anyone <coughs> under the law of parties. And, um, and so that's one law that we could push to eliminate. Uh, I think that we can make that happen before we make the abolishment of the death penalty. And we can, say, we can save that little life. Taking that law up, it's not fair. Even even Republicans are against it. We just gotta unite them and give it up. And, and if you're on a jury, you can call on a jury. If it's a death penalty case, like Juan mentioned. If you say yes, if you have qualms against about the death penalty, you're not sure, or you're against it, you will not get on that jury. And they so call it a, they call it bad qualified jurors. Yeah, you have a biased jury to begin with in those cases, mm -hmm. and uh, so. It's education, it's getting involved, it's a, an important issue. There's a worldwide movement to do away with the death penalty. In fact, we have 21 states now in this country that have abolished the death penalty. 21 states. I've been in, nine of them have been abolished since I've been out. I've been working on all of them. And hope we can get this one done, but if they don't, you are the one who can get it done. Yeah, just Google Rodney Reed and the death penalty and read about him. Mm -hmm. And it would be hard for me to believe that anybody that reads his story doesn't at least have questions about whether he is guilty or not. And if there's questions, to me, it doesn't fit beyond a reasonable doubt. And therefore, maybe we should think about not executing. Because there are questions about whether he committed the crime. And to me, that's what's important. Mm -hmm. We tend to live and think that they must be guilty if they got the death penalty. But that's too often not the case. Our court system is not about justice. It is about winning and losing. Prosecutors do anything they can to win their case. And defense attorneys do whatever they can to win their case. And people accused of crimes are caught in the middle mm -hmm. in that winning and losing. So that's right. If that's right. That's very good. If you're, most of like the people that. on death row have not had the money to get a good legal defense. They haven't been able to get the dream team. And if you don't get the dream team, even if you're innocent, you could very well end up on death row because you don't have the money. Well, very expensive. The lady, the lady that came in our case and lost the four years worth of documents, like everything. Mm -hmm. She's not a judge. Mm -hmm. She's not a judge at the Harris County Jail, uh, the Harris County Court, uh, 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 High Court. You know, uh, how, uh, how do we allow this, you know, to they, happen? And my defense attorney, my defense attorney, the one that threw me in front of the bus, he's also a judge in, in Polk County. So that's what I say, don't go over there. Yeah. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.